right, folks, good afternoon. This is the Marketplace Reset. I'm Anthony Weeks, your host, and we are live on WSDX 970 AM. We're live on the Kalu Network. We're live on Lamenga Bundal. We're live on Jumpstart TV, streaming live on social media, and we are also rebroadcast on Tempo Television Network. It is that time of the week, and uh, certainly look forward each and every week to be with you, uh, to bring you the latest developing breaking news and share with you all the relevant topic and subject matter that affects your life, whether it's in the market, the economy, business, you as a consumer, family, individual. And today uh, we're going to obviously start off our program with our initial uh, discussion on health with my colleague. But before we bring him up, let me introduce this segment and we'll be right back with my colleagues, uh, Linda and Carolyn with their guests. We'll be right back. The reopening measures are slowly taking place amid the coronavirus pandemic. Malls and restaurants are working again, and factories move more and more of their personnel back into the offices. However, that doesn't mean that people won't get sick anymore. On the contrary, there are now many more chances of spreading the virus even farther. To protect the employees and clients of your business, we developed thermocontrol screening stations. It is a quick and safe solution. Thermo control measures temperature at a distance of 25 centimeters. The device is autonomous. It does not require an additional employee to conduct temperature measurements or log the results. It can measure and even recognize masked faces. All of the results are logged automatically and stored in the database. You can use the station to ensure your clients and employees access to your building automatically. John Smith, Brombach. The station can issue entrance passes and grant access to the building after it measured the person's temperature. If the visitor's temperature is high, a notification will be sent and a potential carrier of the virus can't access the building. Thermo Control can send SMS and messenger notifications, as well as notifications over email. Temperature measurement technologies allow businesses to ensure the safety of people and potentially save lives all over the world. All right, folks, we're back, and let me bring up my colleagues, uh, Carolyn and Linda. Ladies, good afternoon. How are we doing today? All is well. How Aww. are you? Doing great. Look at that. Look at that. Second week in a row, you're in separate spaces. Look at that, huh? I know. We're COVID safe. We're, we're exercising our COVID bill of rights to be safe. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We have the right. <laughs> I like that. COVID bill of rights. Nice. COVID bill of rights. And today I'm the one with the glasses on and Carolyn is not. She's usually with her. Oh, there they are. I was wondering. Really? Here we go. <laughs> I, yes, listen, I, 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 love your, I love your colors. I love your colors. My goodness. You got that pastel color going on there. What's going on with you ladies today? It's it's an orange day. I mean, you know, it's not just about having our orange, you know, we have our, of course, these, um, but our orange flowers, our orange thing, because orange is a color that just enables everyone to feel good about themselves, we think. That's, that's our philosophy. It's our value. Fantastic. And uh, it, it attracts goodwill and peace and harmony. Fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so what's, what's been happening since we last met a week ago? How are things going on your end? Well, <laughs> go ahead, Carolyn. We just, there's so a, busy, there's a lot going on. So f first of all, for, for your listeners or viewers that don't realize, we reside in Prince George's County. That's also where we founded our business or co-founded Orange Wall Enterprises. And it's fair to say, that when it's not rush hour, we're 20 minutes from the White House. So we're in this wonderful, we call it the DMV, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. So we are right here at the hub of activity. Linda will tell you that our news is the nation's news. So when we turn on our local news, we're getting the news that is absolutely what matters in Washington, DC. So just being eight miles outside of the DC line, um, Washington, DC line, for those who are very sensitive to that, 
Um, we have had an uptick, almost a 20% increase in the number of new confirmed cases of COVID-19. And we're not trying to be the bearers of bad news, but we're trying to be the most positive, realistic people that we can. Which is, as Linda said, exercising our COVID Bill of Rights, which is a wonderful way of putting it, but also being aware that cases are on the rise. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a very Carolyn makes an excellent point because we're we're following the trends that we're seeing in states that um, right now, just looking at the news and of course our local statistics, and it's so great to have Dr. Grandinson come on because he is all things health metric and metric data, informed data, uh, warehousing and awareness. It it just it it brings to mind what we need to continuously know about keeping track of the numbers and what that truly, mm -hmm. truly means for us. And in Prince George's County, where it seems like we're following this national trend. Um, and then the, you, you obviously the U.S. leads out many numbers that, you know, we just have an opinion on that's very daunting. But we're seeing the consideration of resurging uh, or the, re the surge, but rather the reclosing or re-lockdown, quote unquote, in other parts of the world. It's just really, really a fascinating concept of this pandemic. And I think that we're here for a while. So we have to just get to what um, one of Dr. Grandison's uh, colleagues said, you look at the glass half full and look at the innovation and utilize that innovation to um, spark and enhance and stimulate a better economy. That's right. And better opportunities in learning. Absolutely. Right. If, if, you would, if you would allow me, uh, before, I, before I have you start your discussion with your guests, let me just share some numbers because I'm big on data on numbers uh, based on uh, what uh, Carolyn said about uh, the, the spike in numbers as, yes. as well as you, uh, Linda. Uh, according to Marketplace, the U.S. COVID-19 death reported yesterday, 669 and rising. 669 people died yesterday and that number is rising. U.S. COVID-19 new cases yesterday, 46,647, that number is rising. Mm -hmm. Daily new tests reported in the US is 1.17 million and rising. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID-19 patients now in the hospital, uh, that number is 36,064. Uh, That's 36,064, that number is rising as well. And then you have the, um, just for real quickly, the, the, the economic data, seasonal and retail job open on Glassdoor as of September 2020 versus September 2019. Uh, it is down minus 8%. Job application started at Glassdoor for retail, warehousing, and manufacturing jobs uh, 2020 versus 2019 is up 210%. And, uh, and then e-commerce sales. This is important because uh, Prime Day kicked off on, on Tuesday, yesterday, yes. and you know, Walmart and Target and others are going to follow. So e-commerce sales growth in 2020 projected emarketer.com e said that's going to be up plus 32.4 percent. Can I can I also just add a few stats? Please, like when you please. when you actually like break it down and you look at African Americans and the likelihood of African Americans to be hospitalized versus. Um, white non-Hispanic communities, that is like 4.5, 4.7 times more likely. Wow. When you look at the debt rate, it's like, it's twice, it's probably like 2.1, 2.5-ish. Mm -hmm. And when you are even stratify it even more and look at the elderly, the aging, people over 65, they are, you know, five to 13 times more likely to be hospitalized and like 90 to 630 times more likely to die. Yeah. compared wow. to somebody who's like 18 to 29. Wow. Sorry, I don't want to be Debbie Donald, but I, I support no, your COVID care. <laughs> it is right, very important. This is our education. And education isn't always so rosy or so pleasant, but we can learn from it mm -hmm. as we move forward um, and apply that, that learning so that tomorrow would be a different day. Absolutely. Um, and those statistics and that information is what I think is a good a good jump off, a jump start for our conversation today. <laughs> and I, uh, to your point, Linda, I remember last week, one thing that you said, Dr. Grandison, that really stuck with me is we need to be data informed. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. Data -driven. It's all yeah. about the numbers. 
All about right. the numbers. We, we have got to recognize, first of all, the numbers, and then thanks to you and what you do, recognize what those numbers could and should mean for us used appropriately. Exactly. exactly. Behind all the well, numbers I'm, is always people. Yes. Absolutely. I'm going to go backstage, let you ladies guess. Uh, welcome back, Tyrone, to the program, and uh, I'll be listening. Okay? Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you. Yes, I, I think to Carolyn's point, uh, Carolyn, you were mentioning that the numbers are so critical for how we're to move forward. And what can that glean from us, particularly as we use the terminology and really educate the listeners and the viewers around being data informed. Um, we, we talk about data driven all the time, but now we have something that really takes us into a yeah. whole other utilization of the data and that's being data informed. Can you, you know, can you elaborate on that? And I'll start yeah, with so, Carolyn. So data informed would be seeing the, the data that someone gives to you saying like you know we have an uh, x number of debts so we have like two hundred thousand debts in the us and it's rising and we have hospitalizations and hospitals actually being overtaxed and having no capacity but what does it mean for me as a person what does it mean for me as a black man in my 40s that lives in the western side of the us for me those numbers look even more scary right and it, it simply means that my my patterns, my behavior, just like what you're doing right now, social distancing, uh, limiting the amount of interactions that you actually have with high risk scenarios, mm -hmm. um, that is that is what the, the data should be informing you to actually do. So you get the general you get the general stat of whatever you're interested in, death rate, hospitalization rate. Um, you figure out how it applies to your demographic. And then you figure out what behavior you need to have to change to not be a part of that statistic. Wow, well, yeah. and that's really interesting. So sometimes as we see, for instance, um, in our own state, looking at the number of deaths, they, they track it daily, weekly, and we get a week at a glance. So when we look at the hospitalizations, sometimes people tend not to look at the hospitalizations. They wanna know what they feel is more immediate. In other words, how many new cases, and we know it's 771 in Prince mm -hmm. George's County last week, it was 643. And they go, how many people died? but they're not thinking about the people in the hospital. So as you were to look at the thousands and tens of thousands of those hospitalized, how should we be processing those hospitalizations in terms of making that information work for us? What can we expect in terms of mortality? Yeah, so, so in terms of like looking at it, you have to look at it holistically, right? So if you look at just the hospital itself, then you're, you've missed a point, right? The hospital okay. is a part of a broader ecosystem. And the broader ecosystem involves everyone from um, employment to labor market, so the hospital mm -hmm. workers, it in involves uh, volunteers, it involves um, the food industry, it involves like multiple other industries that are connected to it. Mm -hmm. And once you tap, say, the hospital system and that's maxed, it also means that there are gonna be services that are not available to you, right? Mm -hmm. You need to be aware of that beforehand and either stock up or figure out What's your backup plan if you can't actually immediately access that particular service? That makes a lot of sense because when you think about the ecosystem, I love how you said that because that means that we're all, uh, A, we're all in a system, we're all in one societal community. Mm -hmm. And then B, um, you know, something as um, profound as how are we all linked because I'm fascinated by the numbers and how it moved from one country hopped into a, a part of uh, in the United States in a, in a really a very far south, you know, far Western, what, in Washington state. So as, as far as what um, uh, Northwest as we could get. Um, and then all of a sudden it just exploded across the country and then landed really in some very amazing places like, you know, New York, which is seeing some rises. Um, Florida, and we know why, because of the mm -hmm. habits that 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 data informed information did not settle well, or did not, it was not taken in context of it could affect you in your backyard. Yeah. Um, that was really the the challenge that I have. Um, I mean, the, the two things how do we get people to really think data and how do we get them to think data informed? Exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, the two things that that this entire period has actually thought to, to, well revealed to me that's really important is like one, 
biological phenomenon does not know boundaries, does not know countries. Mm -hmm. The virus is just doing what the virus does. It is replicating mm -hmm. and it's moving. And it, it could care less about, you know, this is France versus this is the US versus mm -hmm. this is like Africa. It is just doing what it's designed to do, right? That's the, the first thing. The second thing is this like leadership matters. So yes. yeah, <laughs> you, you, if, you're, if you're not a data informed leader and you prefer to live in a different reality, <laughs> <laughs> I love when you say that. <laughs> a different reality is exactly right. Yeah, then the measures you're going to take are not going to support your people in actually taking the right steps and being data informed. Right. Wow. So, you know, I'm sorry for cutting you no off problem. because it, you were saying it, just being informed. So let me just tell you some of the odd conversations that I've been privy to hear. Uh, for instance, when we when this first came down on us, there was not enough hand sanitizer. There were not enough mm -hmm. masks, and people were saying, "Make your own mask." And we had, you know, even the governor of a local state, you know, showing us how to make one out of a T-shirt and all those kinds of things. And now, recently, I heard um, someone say every single store has hand sanitizer to the overflow. They have masks everywhere. You can get them everything. What that means is that we no longer really have a problem. It's just become a bit of a, it's become almost like a holiday drives the sale of cards and the sale mm -hmm. of kids and things like that. So they were getting, becoming very relaxed because there seemed to be an abundance of supply. They said, if we were really in a crisis, we wouldn't have any of this stuff. So, how can you how can you make all this make sense? Um, I, I can't. <laughs> it boils down to it. So, so with those two examples, like, the interesting thing is like it's a novel coronavirus, right? So, mm -hmm. we know very little about it from the very beginning, and the information we know in the scientific community is changing. It's evolving because we're learning more about it. Mm -hmm. So, with with hand sanitizer, there may be you know plentiful in the markets, but how many of them are actually 90% or over alcohol? Exactly. Right, mm -hmm. for the mask, like there's just a study that came out in the National Institute of Health that says the different types of masks have different uh, levels of resistance mm -hmm. to the virus being transmitted. So not all masks are created equal, right? The highest one is your N95, then you have the ones that have like a, um, what they call a, antimicrobial antibacterial layer on the front. Mm -hmm. and at the very lowest level, you have the ones that you probably find in all the stores, right? Mm -hmm. So even though the supply is there, are you, are you, do you have the supply of the right things? Wow. That's the key at this point in time. I think that it's going to take a very widespread, really um, deliberate and intentional effort to communicate a different messaging um around what this means and how this can no longer be our normal because exactly. it's so devastating and because we know that the virus is so opportunistic and that it has a punch and power that it can m migrate and it can certainly mutate um in such a way that we can never really get the science to wrap its full arm around it even with the potential of you know the race to a vaccine not a cure um, I'm curious to, to understand a little bit of what you think that we should be sharing with our young people who really actually are so data informed um, mm -hmm. that it's shocking how much data that they are ingesting and then able to really, um, uh, you know, intelligently share. Can we figure out how we can use their voice, their advocacy, you know, perhaps even their habits if we can get them to a place of really understanding that this generation, that generation is going to be the ones that fix and mitigate these things in the future. Completely agreed. So, I mean, I think from that perspective, it's all about all the problems here reside in people, right? Either people's lack of trust in science and scientists, mm -hmm. people's, I don't want to say lack of leadership. Um, let, me, let me phrase it differently. So if someone's job or livelihood or dependence or personality is dependent upon a fact not existing or not being true, that mm -hmm. fact will not exist, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Even though it is fact. Oh, yeah. Right? So getting people to the point where selfishly, you know, they have to admit that the reality is COVID is real. Mm 
-hmm. It's very dangerous. You should follow the World Health Organization's like guidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, wear the mask, social distance, wash your hands after most interactions, and keep up to date with the updates that they're they're giving to you from the World Health Organization. Um, I don't recommend at this point listening to anything that the CDC says. Um, mm -hmm. so they, that's because, interesting because simply because you know there is there is political juggling that's happening between the cdc and the department of health and human services where there is mm -hmm. there is some lack of transparency happening there and we're not sure that the data that's coming out is not being massaged to fit a political narrative yeah. or not <laughs> And, and, you know, and Dr. Grandison, you know, don't be shy about that because it's been widely reported in the news for the general public to consume and draw their own conclusions. So, you know, the the political police won't come and get you by saying that because you know, we're, what we're trying to do is create educated, you know, listeners and educated um, family members and, and colleagues and, you know, extended family members that are going to uh, feel that they can not be overwhelmed by the information, but where can they turn where it impacts on the on the world? And and you know, and we hope that in the future there will be some credibility restored. I think just by virtue of one day one piece of information is up on the sites, and that's you know, state level health departments that mm -hmm. are feeding it from this information. And it could be that we just have to have a greater sense of disciplinary organizations that are third party. They are um, independent in nature that yeah. can drive uh, a lot of this without having a, a financial or a political, it's pure science, pure humanitarian uh, support. So I thank you for, you know, sharing that, you know, don't be shy. I don't know if Carolyn, you have a thought around this. <laughs> no, I, do, and I, I really applaud you. And thank you, Linda, for saying that. I really applaud the fact we need, to, we're looking for intelligent voices with accurate information. So I think that, and up to this point, or at least up and up until the beginning of this year, we've always looked to the CDC to give us, as they used to say, the facts, just the facts. Mm -hmm. And so now this is very, very different. We're in a very different climate, which is why this conversation right now is so very real. Okay. The problem comes in when you're being fed information that fits an agenda, the real yeah. people that suffer will be those that are hospitalized, those who are impacted by those who are hospitalized, and those who pass away. So it's important to know that right now, this not might not be the right tone. You may need to look somewhere else, or you may need to, mm -hmm. you know, those who are who are disconnected from, uh, you know, a particular agenda. And then later on, as Linda you mentioned, hopefully that can be restored. So that's really good. As a matter of fact, that's some, as Linda will say, that's some learning for me today because. <laughs> It's a fourth habit. You know, we go FDA, CDC, WHO. So now I, I need to, you know, you have to dial it back. <laughs> we had mm -hmm. to do that as it related to even our news outlets. And so maybe we need to filter that information. I, I think that that's, I, I think it's incredible that you said that. Yeah, and, I mean, you know, it's... also tag teams that right now is how do we help um, as advocates? What would you say that I, I, you know, when I think about one of my key roles in life as um, an advocate, I put an adjective in front of that or now, depending on how you look at it, um, as a parent advocate, because mm -hmm. I'm more concerned about right now what I can only digest and that is how to keep my, my, my young daughters uh, safe and myself safe because we had some information come to us and this information is, an impact on our ability to be insured people in the United States of America, that mm, yeah. with a diagnosis or an antibody um, or even recovering, that we may have challenges in the near future with re-upping our insurance or um, um, being coming insured, you know, as my young children are insured, but at some point they will come off of my insurance and go on mm -hmm. to theirs. You know, these will be pre-existing conditions and we see before us uh, a dialogue and a potential um, uh, uh, Supreme Court that could, ch you know, change a lot of things in this landscape around pre-existing conditions, therefore the affordability or even access to insurance. From a data or from just your thoughts, you know, in and out of the data community, yeah, can you share a little bit about that, you, your thoughts you, and opinions on it? You hit it on the head, like you have to actually like know what your sphere of influence is 
-hmm. and be the one to actually champion the issues, the mm -hmm. real issues backed by the real data um, to your community because that your community will actually listen to you, right? That goes for mm -hmm. yourself as an advocate, it goes for young people. I mean, the thing that people don't realize at this point is this like COVID in and of itself, COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's not just about the respiratory problems it actually creates, it actually creates long-term problems even for those who have covered, right? In terms of heart issues, memory issues, like breathing capacity, it affects like, it literally affects like most parts of your body. Um, right now the science is, is kind of leaning towards the recognition that you can get reinfected. <laughs> Right. Good to know. Yes, because we've heard that we've heard that you can become immune, quote in quote, um, um, to this. And I don't know if the data supports that. Um, the data supports immunity for one strain for a particular period of time. But I mean, how many strains of COVID are in existence in the world at this point? At least forty. Oh, see, that's <laughs> right. I didn't know that. That specifically five. How about you, Carolyn? <laughs> well, that number is much higher than we had heard before, and and for the longest while, or at least up until the beginning of August, they kept touting that Sweden had, you know, had locked the market on herd uh, immunity, and then we heard the big reversal around that. So. You know, you're enlightening us. So great. One out of 40, that, that's not good odds. I'm immune for one, but I'm still, there's 39 others and it's continuing to morph. Yeah, at least. Well, can, I, can, I chime in, can I chime in? Because I, I heard you guys said something about reinfection. Yes. It was reported yesterday, breaking news. The first case in the United States, a 25 year old person got reinfected a second time. And they're saying the second time, the second infection is more severe than the first. Um, yeah. oh. well, well, we should already be aware of this because this happened in Italy and France like months ago, right? Again, the virus is, a, is the virus. It doesn't really, it acts the same way, it behaves the same way. It doesn't care about borders, right? Mm -hmm. So we already, we already have indicators from the experiences in China from the experiences in Europe, we should be paying attention to it. That is being informed of, of what's happening. That's using the data to our advantage. Like and we that, should, we should, and, yeah, and we does should. that data from those other countries um, more reliable. into the World Health Organization yeah. and therefore it can be utilized in some way. So we should teach our kids because I, I'm aware that um, World Health Organization has kid centric sites and, and data, you know, and, and, and material that is age appropriate um, yes. all the way up to those of us who may or may not get into the number crunching of it, but that's a great source. I think that's a, a strong takeaway is that we should be looking at what other countries and their data uh, informed agencies and health departments are doing yes. that we can then incorporate into our own community. I think that's yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's. Would that be a fair assessment on some level? I mean, it would be amazing assessment. Like, mm -hmm. I, that's what I do. That's what I recommend to everyone I talk to. In the US, the first demographic of people to actually get hit by COVID were the elderly, right? It was, it first took hold in nursing homes, right? It was a nursing home in Kirkland, Washington, mm -hmm. where you had the first reported, well, the first reported case, but you know, two months afterwards, they found out through an autopsy that somebody in San Jose, California, um, was the actual first case, like mm -hmm. way before. And now they're tracking it back to the first case being in, in the U.S. around November, December, like 2019, right? So, so if you look mm -hmm. at like the elderly community and what they've been going through, we're talking about again ecosystem. One making tough financial decisions and being in very difficult spots going through and questioning and having significant mental health issues, um, having mm -hmm. a lot of guilt and emotions around potentially like infecting and being vectors, being very susceptible to misinformation, like all of these things we were seeing from April, May, and we probably will actually see in the wider population, we probably are seeing it right now, right? Mm -hmm. But it was there. You know, the evidence was there, the data was there, we, we could have used it, we could have actually incorporated it. Like that, it, that's what it means to be informed by the data and the evidence, 
Wonderful. So but as we close out, because obviously time goes by when you have somebody really intelligent that you're interacting with, I know Linda, right? So just we wake up in the morning and we're trying to get enough information to make intelligent decisions, yes. but not so much that it really affects our overall attitude, et cetera. First, what should we do? Wake up in the morning and what should we check on before we move forward? What sh how should we? I, I would do a, a Google alert on World Health Organization coronavirus and have that be the first email I read every morning. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. Sometimes it's a simple informed things that make a difference. So Google yeah. alert on all my cell phones and um, on my all my emails. So yep. that's the first thing. And then share the data, share the information. Exactly. Because they, they will be actually tracking the cases country by country all over the world and providing as much new evidence as the community provides. That's excellent. That's excellent. Wow. And I'm going to do that. I set Google alerts. So this is a brand new one I will be setting. It Anthony, did you have any questions? I see you've popped in to. No, I, I, just, the next I, I just want to share with you guys before you go that today on the second segment of the show, I will be delivered a free uh, oven baked pizza and I will be having a slice of pizza live on the show today. I just wanted to, I just wanted to hear that today. You just wanted so, to brag that we only have food and you have delicious food? It's just, I just couldn't resist that. <laughs> well, just make sure everyone has gloves on and that you make sure you wash your hands and put your mask on. That's what we do. That's it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, we're gonna have, uh, we started our campaign, uh, Help Local Businesses Challenge. And so we're starting to feature local businesses on the Help Local Business Challenge. So today's uh, uh, pizza uh, uh, business, they're gonna deliver me a fresh, freshly baked pizza, and I'm gonna sample on the air to the show and have the interview with, the, uh, with this local business that we're gonna be featuring. What's the uh -huh. name of the local business so we can give uh -huh. them a shout out on ours? Yeah, Alfio's, Alfio's mm -hmm. Pizza. Alfio's Pizza. Well, I commend you and Dr. Grandinson for what you're doing because all of this is what we're trying to do is to reset the uh, pandemic economy. Absolutely. And uh, the Pearl Long-Term Care Services that is coming uh, forward and how that's going to help with uh, addressing the needs of uh, caregivers and family caregivers as well as uh, jumpstarting the economy by introducing small businesses because that's going to be the lifeline um, of where we're heading. I agreed. And, and and the good thing about like the coronavirus at this point, the two things that I find are good is it is it is leading digital transformation, right? It is wow. It is accelerating it because people recognize that we have to actually change the way in which we actually work. Yes. But some businesses, some medical practices are losing eighty to ninety percent of their revenue. So they have to get on this market. And the second thing is it's like it it has a, a good side in that it's helping us reconnect and come to this norm of being digital and having virtual meetings and virtual connections are not so normal. So you're actually rekindling lots of like old friendships and, and um, connections, right? Yeah. Uh, and the final thing is, sorry, I said two, but it's actually three. Okay. It's an opportunity to rethink how we're doing everything. Yes. So the, the one thing that that I discovered like a decade ago is it's like most cities, most countries I've come to make are like, you know, one industry, you know, it's sugarcane, tourism, uh, IT. And if you look back at history, right, look through history, go back a hundred years, all one industry, one, one town, one company, entities, municipalities, always go through a period of recession and failure because that industry goes. Wow. Right. Always. <laughs> All right, um, ladies. Unfortunately, unfortunately we're waiting the end of the segment. Our, our colleagues are waiting here. actually the, the, the other okay. in the studio for queue up, so. We're uh, sorry. It's fine. Opportunity for us to reimagine and to, to do something else. Thank you so much for having so to, to reimagine, to understand the data, as well as utilize that data. So thank you so much, Dr. Grandison, for our part two conversation. Okay. You had a whole lot we needed to get from you. So we were really oh. glad you were able to make accommodation. Tony, enjoy your pizza. Yes. Thank you. I'll save thank some you. I'll save some for you. 
All right. All right thank have you. A good one. All right. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Have a good one, guys. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Small business is a part of all of us each and every day. It's where we eat. It's where we shop. It's where we go to meet our friends and colleagues. In the wake of COVID-19, our small business community desperately needs our help. We must do our part to help our local communities to once again thrive. We must focus our attention on the small businesses that are the fabric of our great nation. SureUp is a network of small business owners, their employees, and local consumers all working in unison to support each other. By creating incentives for consumers to think local before considering regional and national providers to fulfill their needs, we create local job opportunities and rebuild our communities. In addition, through AI-driven tools and machine learning, in just five minutes a day, SureUp assists business owners in improving their social media presence, which enhances their visibility among consumers and levels the playing field so that local businesses can better compete with large name brand online competitors. When local businesses leverage the SureUp platform, full-time and part-time employees, whether W-2 or 1099, are rewarded with a variety of voluntary perks and member benefit options. These include discounts on the things people do every day, access to low-cost, subscription-based telehealth and teletherapy, discounted prescription drug plans, connection to exclusive Prosper resources, and so much more. All for less than the cost of a cup of coffee each day. The Jumpstart Marketplace is here to support the health and wellness of individual employees, as well as the health of businesses in the local communities in which we live and work. We're all in this together. So join us as we reinvigorate our local community, and improve the physical and financial health of working America. All right, folks, I'm back. And thank you so much for tuning live to the Marketplace Reset. I'm Anthony Weeks, your host. I'm joined by my colleagues and uh, co-hosts and contributors on the second segment of the program. We just heard from, well, we're still in the first segment, though, but on the second half of the first segment, uh, we, we heard just heard from our colleagues, Linda uh, Dorman and Carolyn uh, Howell from the uh, thermal, orange thermal uh, control system. And they had, uh, they had a continuation of the discussion with their guest, uh, Mr. Tyrone uh, Grandison. I really good, good, good information, enjoyed the conversation. I was able to chime in here or there. But I want, now I'm gonna bring in uh, the, my colleagues for the second, uh, second half of the first segment. And we're gonna continue our discussion here on the program because the issue of uh, the heightened, or should, should I say the early start of the, the big juggernauts, the national e-commerce e uh, uh, stores or online uh, platforms have now come out early. Yesterday, uh, Amazon Prime kicked off Prime Day. Of course, Walmart, Targets are gonna follow suit uh, as well. And that means that, right, it's convenient for you, the consumer, great deals, uh, the, 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 the ease of shopping, you know, um, getting what you need, wonderful. But guess what? It is going to literally suck the oxygen out of the room uh, for the so local small businesses. And so we've kicked off, we've kicked off our Help Local Business Challenge. And what that means is we're inviting you to be able to do your part while we support uh, making sure that you get the best bang for your buck across the line, across the spectrum as a consumer, please don't neglect, let's not cannibalize uh, those local businesses that are just simply trying to uh, survive in this environment, uh, support those local businesses. So uh, we're gonna do our part. We're gonna give them the tool that they need to be able to, to, be able to do business remotely and virtually, just like the big, the big uh, players as well but you have to keep in mind that we have to sustain those businesses. So let me bring in my colleagues. Um, uh, she is the lead person for this segment, uh, Terry Coxon. She is our small business expert. And there is Terry uh, waiting patiently. Terry, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm good. I'm good. Anthony, um, welcome. I'm welcome. I feel great today. I think it's a great opportunity for us to 
make sure that we are encouraging anyone listening to do business with small business because small business is that engine. And so, um, like you said, we will be encouraging small businesses uh, can't be as competitive, but they have quality products. And so, you know, they're not the big Amazons or the Walmarts, but we're encouraging our uh, consumers, our people that are watching small businesses. It's the season. Um, it's the holiday season. So we're asking you to go in and buy local. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, Colin, what, what, I mean, obviously yep. you're, you're across the pond, you're in, you're in the United Kingdom. Do you have the same, uh, do you guys have the same problem we're having in the U.S. in terms of it's, it's the holiday time and you have the big uh, on online e-commerce companies sucking all the oxygen out of the room and having local businesses suffer in, in the process? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a really major concern for local businesses all over all over Europe, really, but certainly in the UK where I'm based. Amazon sales have gone through the roof in the UK. And I'm guilty. I've been ordering some stuff from Amazon. But I can't find local stores that are open. Um, a lot of the local stores around here are having to limit their opening hours for various reasons. So um, it's tough to get what you want sometimes locally. But I always make every effort to shop locally as much as I can, given I live in a very rural community. Um, but I know a lot of small stores are saying they may never reopen. They might, might never ever be able to reopen properly because they've been hit so hard by them. They've still got their rent to pay on their um, on their stores, so they're not the, the landlords are not letting them off with the rent. And these people are saying you just can't afford to keep the stores open anymore. You know, it's dreadful already. Also, the area I live in is a bit of a tourist area. So there's a lot of tourist shops that sell gifts and souvenirs and stuff. And I was talking to a lady that owns one of those shops the other day, and she was she was literally in tears because she said, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know what I'm going to do. So the tourism's fallen away. And people don't have money to spend because obviously people are all being furloughed on wages and stuff like that. So anybody selling something that's a non-essential item, they're really, really hurting. So, yeah, we've got exactly the same situation over here that you've got over there and uh, the big the big um juggernauts as you described them they're making money hand over fist but they're taking me to like the expense poor guy absolutely uh so we have uh we have returning guests to this afternoon uh ben roy hosier he is the managing director for uh, a turnkey uh, e-commerce solution, uh, both on the merchant side as well as consumer side, and they have some great technology that they're developing to really in, in, enable and empower uh, both local small businesses as well as consumers to be able to um, really get the biggest bang for their buck um, as as they try to you know spend their money wisely in in this environment, and and so so clearly uh, what we are going to do is we're going to continue the discussion from last week. Uh, like we did, uh, Terry, uh, on that path. Uh, but Terry, before we, we before we bring in uh, Van Roy, uh, what, what's going on in New York? I'm I'm hearing that the numbers are really spiking up again. Now you guys are really pulling back. What, what's what's happening in New York? So I mentioned it last week. We have about seven zip codes in New York uh, that the numbers have gone back up. Um, but fortunately, today, when I was listening to reports from uh, the governor, the numbers are actually uh, going back down. So what they did was they had a crackdown in those areas. They closed things back down. Um, he he lifted, He had some really heavy sanctions on some schools that were open um, and were not social distancing and people not wearing their masks. Uh, big crackdown on bars and restaurants that were not doing what they needed to do. And it's a continuous effort to make sure everyone is in compliance. So you're absolutely right. The seven zip codes, the numbers spiked up. And now that we see them going, we see the numbers going back down. It's all about compliance, Anthony. Um, this is something that we talked about and we continue to talk about it. You know, we know it works. We know that wearing your mask works. We know that hand sanitizer works and, and making sure that the, the spaces are being cleaned properly. Those are the things that work and those are the things that we continue to do and make sure that we're social distancing. And so that's where we're back at again here in New York. So so, so clearly we're seeing uh, a resurgence in both the United States and in the United Kingdom. Same, They're having the same issues. Uh, obviously two different heads of state, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One in President Donald Trump and the other one is Bo Boris Johnson. 
Uh, I see that the uh, the Labour Party has given uh, J Boris Johnson a vote of no confidence on his handling of the COVID-19. And it, it's like, it's, it just seems like there's like a, a mirrored response. Is it me? Or, or, or are you guys seeing and hearing the same thing? It's like a mirrored response between the US and the UK. Are they like taking a page out of the same book or something? <laughs> Unfortunately, it yeah, feels like that, Anthony. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, uh, um, Terry, what were you saying? I said, unfortunately, it feels like that. I mean, it was like just a couple of weeks ago when we were on, we were talking about how the teachers um, had a no, the teachers union had a no confidence vote against, um, of course, Mayor Bill de Blasio because of his response to COVID in the schools. And they felt like the children and the teachers weren't being protected. And so now we're hearing a no confidence over in the UK. So yeah, I think they are taking, I think they're taking the same page out of the same book. But again, it has to go back to compliance. If we know something works, it's something that we should continue to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Van Roy, uh, you're in Atlanta. Uh, and uh, Atlanta is a busy city as well. Uh, lots happening there. Uh, that is the state itself. Uh, I think that they are more, it's a Republican governor but you have a, a Democratic mayor in Atlanta. Uh, that must be some hot mess uh, in terms of the whole politics of, of, of trying to deal with COVID-19. Uh, what, what are you seeing in your neck of the woods? Talk to us, to give us a quick update what's happening in Atlanta. Well, Anthony and uh, Colin and Terry, here in, here in Atlanta, uh, the, this area is pretty much not a reflection of the entire state of Georgia. Uh, mainly not because of uh, Mayor Bottoms and, and their surrounding counties and their government, but because uh, once once people realize that uh, hey, we had a crisis and that mask wearing works, everybody has basically been complying. So most of the the problems and the outbreaks is in the, out, the exterior 20 counties that, that doesn't include Atlanta. So here, uh, it's pretty much business as usual. Everybody's gotten to the point where, hey, as you go into every business you know you put your mask on you do what you have to do uh, and you come up there's been very been, been, been a whole lot of uh, acceptance you don't see a whole lot of resistance uh, i'm here in uh, clayton county this is just south of uh, fulton county here in atlanta and no matter where i've gone in the last seven or eight counties you see basically when you get out in the rural parts nobody's wearing masks uh, so the further away from atlanta you go uh, which is the more republican you get as the the least, least amount of mask wearing that you see, so I don't I don't think uh, we have a whole lot of issues here in 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 Atlanta, Fulton, and uh, those sixteen counties that make up the Greater Atlanta area. So uh, most of the merchants are okay, except for you know food takeoff, out, outdoor dining, and stuff like that. As far as the merchants are concerned, they just put them require you to put a mask on, and you go in, you do what you got to do, and you get out. So it seems to be working right now. You, you know, uh, when we look at the small business and their capacity to do business, uh, but it, there's also so, also something to be said for the, some of the, the customers that they have and they cater to, because okay. some of these customers don't have the capacity. They they want to do business. They don't have bank accounts. They don't have credit cards. They have cash. And mm -hmm. so clearly, clearly the ability to, to, to enable businesses to do business with someone uh, remotely or virtually, uh, if they have cash, uh, is what we want to kind of talk about today, Terry. Um, yes. and, and so, Ben Roy, um, give us a little bit of background in terms of the technology that you have that will help consumer, even if they don't have a bank account, even if they don't have a credit card, but yet we're telling businesses that they need to be able to have the ability to do business remotely and virtually online, but that's a huge uh, a, uh, segment of their their their, their uh, customer base. Talk to us about in terms of how you can uh, empower these business to, to be able to do so. Well, as far as uh, we, what we've done here at Six Tech and, and our sister uh, company of uh, Caribbean International, in order to bring that percentage of people who are either unbanked or underbanked into the marketplace, we first of all had to find a way for them to be able to transact a without a bank account and a and two without a major credit or debit card so our solution for that was uh, a downloadable e-wallet that they can load at any particular any participating merchant or any merchant that has a merchant account or has a point of sale unit and they could be able to load their wallet 
and connect that to our, uh, our payment platform, which would be a QR pay, uh, NFC, and or debit and credit card, so that they can be able to purchase in person, online, contactless, or in person, uh, contactless with card. So that was uh, the first and the biggest part of it. So now anybody, no matter who you are, as long as you can download the app, as long as you have uh, a smartphone, you can download the app, you can put money, uh, cash, money into your wallet, which then be converted to a digital dollar. And then you can use those, either come in the store, mm -hmm. scan, or use your card, tap and pay, swipe, dip, or stay online and, and use your wallet that's connected to any uh, merchant account that accepts Visa, Mask, and American Express or Discover. So nice. everybody will get an opportunity to participate. Uh, you don't have to worry, and only what you have in your wallet is what's on your card. You, since your card, your scanner is attached to your wallet, so you don't have to worry about losing more than you have. If you only have $200 in your wallet, that's all you can spend. There is no overdraft fees. There is no credit. It's only what you have you can use. So only what you put in can be jeopardized. So nobody can go in uh, and clear on your bank account. You can just have what you want. Or you can have individual disposable virtual cards that you can use for Amazon or for your shopping that's only tied to that one particular merchant. So we're trying to make it easy for everybody to get a chance to be able to use what's available to them without being jeopardized of having their, you know, their data or their money you know, either stolen or you know, misplace. Hey, Another Terry, question, Anthony. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, like you read my mind because I was about to ask you, uh, <laughs> how how problematic is it for small business to, to, to have not have the ability to do business online uh, where a large percentage of their customer is, you know, not having bank accounts, uh, just want to do cash? So um, before I before I go into how problematic it is, I do have a question for Velroy. How are they replenishing the cards? How do they replenish the cards? Uh, the, the the cards are replenished as you add cash. I mean, the, those cards are good for you know two three years, so uh, they're really totally reloadable. So you keep on adding. You keep going to anyone if you need. If you have cash, you go to the location and top up, or you can you can link any any credit the debit card to the to your wallet, or have anybody that has a credit debit nice. card send you the money. So, and is there an interest rate? Is there some kind of fee that's charged? Uh, the the app the wallet strictly strictly operates on a transaction fee. So only when you do a transaction, there's a small fee uh, for that. Uh, like okay. our uh, our awesome. QR pay is probably like a one to one and a half percent. So it's almost you know half of what you would have to pay if you were accepted a major card like a, a Visa or Mastercard. Awesome, awesome, Anthony. That's really important because as we know that a lot of people in our black and brown communities are still unbanked, right? And so that's where we're coming to that problematic problem. Uh, that's where we're coming to that problematic question that you just asked me. So if um, this is a great tool, right? So if they're able to load their cards for the amount of purchase that they need, then that's a really, really good thing. Some of them are unbanked. Some of them are afraid of banks for whatever reason. And so this gives them an opportunity to be able to make purchases, to uh, book hotels, to rent cars, to do whatever they need to do. And so that really is a good product. I'm glad to hear a little more about it uh, this week, Felbury. Yeah. Anthony. Yeah, go ahead. So you asked me a question about small businesses. So with everything being online right now, it is extremely problematic for customers that are unbanked to be able to get the same amount of services. Now, similar to what Velra just is described, there are some services, um, like in New York and New Jersey, for um, New York, New Jersey, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. There, there are things that we call uh, check cashing places. And so businesses can go on and they can load cards and they can use um, um, customers can go in and load their a credit card, a Visa MasterCard, and they can use that for some purchases. But not all um, all of the businesses are taking that type of, uh, of service. Other customers are going moving more towards what we call Cash App, PayPal, Venmo, um, and they're using Zelle. So these are the services that customers are using. And so they're being so somewhat, they're being forced to get a bank account. Um, I've heard from some of my seniors that still prefer to have paper checks that are now, especially during the pandemic, you weren't able to go in and get your services. And a lot of things were shut down. A lot of things were delayed. And so now the banks have made it easier for you to go online 
and open up an account. And so you're now able to, you don't have to go into the bank. You still have to have all of the, uh, the documents that you need, but you can actually open up an account on uh, online. And that allows them to now connect that bank account to those services that I just told you about, the Venmo, the Zells, the Cash Apps. And so that's how they're using um, the services of our small businesses. Because as we know, when things shut down, it, it really is a cashless, uh, a cashless economy that we're using here in the tri-state area. And so some of the unbanked are now forced to get those bank accounts and banks know this, so they're making it easier by giving them the opportunity to open up bank accounts online. In fact, one bank, I just uh, had a conversation with the new bank manager in the Bed-Stuy area, and she says that Carver is really changing the game. Carver Federal Bank is now allowing you to open up a bank account with no fees. The businesses don't have to pay fees. The personal accounts don't have to pay fees. And so they're opening up account. They're maintaining your account for free. And I think that that is really going to change the game, especially in our black and brown communities. Uh, absolutely. Uh, that's I'm really elated to hear this uh, mm -hmm. because uh, th these are all hurdles, obstacles to for, for both businesses and mm -hmm. consumer uh, to do business seamlessly, especially in this uh, really uh problematic environment called the pandemic environment mm -hmm. uh colin uh oh, so colin's about to leave colin let me i want to ask you are, are the same do you see the same similar problems in the uk between small business and and, and consumers yeah. in the ability to do business absolutely yeah yeah absolutely i mean there's um a lot of controversy about a move to a cashless society in this country because um, certainly there's a lot of people in the community who are unbanked you know, elderly people seniors homeless people you cannot get a bank account even when i'm addressed and uh, your homeless person is getting from the as well and so these people have been excluded from basically being able to perform essential transactions so the kind of stuff that van roy's doing is really really valuable for those kind of people because there are millions and millions of them millions of people in that situation uh young people students other people that sometimes don't have bank accounts so yeah there are millions of people that re have a requirement for something like this some way to be able to take part in what's ostensibly a cashless society but without having all the credit checks that you need to have to get a credit card or to get a bank account or to do what you need to do so yeah it's absolutely identical situation over here I've got a question for Vanroy. Vanroy, what do you think about Bitcoin wallets and things like that? Do you think there's much future for for um, cyber currencies in the world? Uh, Con, I, I I do think I do think that uh, uh, Bitcoin, other cryptocurrency and digital currencies are here to stay. In fact, uh, in addition to our traditional fiat account that we're doing right now, uh, we do have a, 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 a provision in for us to create a, another wallet for those on the digital crypto uh, side of the coin. So we can't, we can't ignore it. They're here. And I think it's going to be a part of us uh, going forward. So we want to make sure that for those who want to participate in that, in that type of technology and with those, those products, there is a way for them to do it as well, whether you're bank or on bank as well with that own wallet. All right. All yeah, right. Yeah, the reason I asked the question. Go ahead, in the past, I've worked with the Isle of Man, which is a small independent European country. That's only a million accounts. Yes. And I know that government was looking to see what they could do to become a crypto economy. Um, that thought was a more effective way to run yes. the economy and more and more things. So a lot of the stores accept Bitcoin now. And um, a lot of the people that are on welfare have a Bitcoin wallet. It's an interesting. Approach. Whether it's successful, or not, I don't really know. It's certainly something they've been looking at, and something they've been experimenting with. Well, well, certainly, uh, Colin, on that on on that issue, uh, the, the 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 network of Mastercard and Visa, which are the obviously the dominant, uh, uh, you know, card payment uh, companies. Uh, Mastercard is really being um, uh, sort of uh, proactive in that space. So, if you have a Mastercard. MasterCard is going to also uh, enable you to be able to, if you want to do a, a bit Bitcoin transaction or cryptocurrency transaction, uh, that you're going to be able to do that because you're going through the MasterCard network. 
Okay, so so that is that is that is developing a, as we speak, and and so uh, companies like Van Roy uh, and their ability to 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 allow merchants to connect with each other with consumer. So whether it's fiat currency or cryptocurrency, uh, Van Roy's company and his technology will be able to bridge the gap uh, with those types of um, uh, of consumer and businesses. Okay. Right. Well, uh, guys, it, it's it's the top of the hour. I do have to switch to the other studio, and of course, you know you know the drill. Uh, you can sign in on the other side, but I do have to end out this this part of the uh, the first segment of the show. And my guest, uh, our our uh, help local business challenge uh, guest, is here in the studio with me. Uh, I'm going to he, he's delivering me a freshly baked pizza. So I mean, I don't want to rub it in, but you, you know, that's not. No, fair. I know, that's I know, fair. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 uh, please, join me, here, please join me on the other side while well, we switch over to the second segment. All right. Thank you so much, guys. This is the marketplace. Okay. This is Anthony Weeks. We'll see you on the other side in the second segment. Thanks, Anthony.